the Lord, everybody. Book of Romans. Last week we had an introduction to the purpose of the Holy Ghost. This week we're going to get into the meat and potatoes of it. Romans chapter 8. Verse number 9. Romans 8, verse 9. The first thing is, and I guess let me just start off by saying that this isn't in any particular order. It's not like um, it has to be one thing before it's another. There are no particular order to these, and you may know of others. Before I'm completely finished, you may know of others that I don't even have on this list, but it's a pretty decent list of things that the Holy Ghost is, what its purpose is. Romans chapter 8, verse 9. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. If any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So the first thing is, it is a sign or a seal of ownership of God's. I know that there are a lot of people that feel like decent people are going to go to heaven. Good people are going to go to heaven. But clearly the Bible says if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Second Timothy chapter 2 and verse number 19 says it like this. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. Having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ just do whatever he feels like doing. Let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Now, what is iniquity? Does anyone know what iniquity is? Hidden sin? Anybody else? Any sin? Iniquity is, um, in, it's quite literally lawlessness. It's sin. Um, but it is a violation of what God says. So any time we, if God says be right here, and you end up right there, then you have missed it. Right? Anything short of what God has asked. Now, that's not the same for everybody. Salvation is the same for everybody. How you live after that is not necessarily the same for everybody because you have the Holy Ghost. And, and we're going to get into this in just a minute, but you have the Holy Ghost, which is supposed to unction you. There may be something that is not wrong for one person, but God tells you, leave that alone. Or someone else may not do something, but God tells you, there's nothing wrong with that. Now, I'm not talking about sin. I'm talking about, let me give an example. Uh, I think it was uh, Elder Hunter in Benton Harbor who chewed tobacco before he got saved. After he received the Holy Ghost, he felt convicted about chewing gum. He said it reminded him too much of when he chewed tobacco. And so he quit, chew he wouldn't even chew gum because it convicted him. He didn't preach and tell people it was a sin to chew gum, but he left it alone. Does that make sense? So it may be something that's okay, but God tell you, leave it alone. How do we fight 
things that bother us, the best way to fight it is stay as far away from it as you can. And so if you have something that bothers you, I, all I can say is stay as far away from it as you can. All right. It is a seal from God that he owns you, that you are his. The Lord knows them that are his. And without that seal, when the rapture takes place, you will not be raptured. That's, that's scripture. I have family members that I love very much. And if I could just make a little room for them and, and make them be all right with God, without going through the process of the new birth, like the scripture says, I would do it. I would. I want my family saved. I want people that I love saved. And if, I, if there was a way out around it, I would do it. But I can't change. None of us can change the Bible to make it okay for somebody. And I've talked about my grandfather before. He was a very good, clean, decent man. As a child growing up, you know, you don't really know a person until you live with them. As a child growing up, I would stay with my grandparents a lot. Never heard him raise his voice. Never heard him use profanity. Didn't drink. Didn't smoke. He my grandmother, anything that the church was doing, if she needed a ride, he'd bring her over here and drop her off. And anybody else that needed a ride, he'd pick them up, drop them off, go back home and read his paper. And when it was time, when church was over, he'd come back over here and pick them back up again. Never bothered with them. Never bothered with my grandmother and any of the activities. When the church needed something, if they asked him, he would do it. He, he made the rails, I think this rail right out here, on this, on these, on my steps, or the steps going out the side door, I think he made those. He made a sign for the church when they needed, when they wanted a poster for something. I remember him drawing a poster that hung in the stairwell because uh, he was a cartoonist, so he, he would do artwork, all kinds of things. You couldn't spot his life. You couldn't. He, he lived better than some of the saints did. But that didn't make him right with God. If he didn't get the Holy Ghost, then it wasn't nothing but the Lord. I mean, he got the Holy Ghost, and in less than a month, he was in the nursing home and, and uh, almost catatonic. Couldn't talk, couldn't do anything. Stayed there until he died. But if he hadn't got the Holy Ghost, he didn't have the seal, he wouldn't have made it. Now, for people like that, I would say, surely God would make an exception to the rule. But no. The next thing the Holy Ghost is, St. John chapter 14. St. John chapter 14, verse 16. Let's see, where is John? <laughs> not yes, she said after Mark. It, he, is, he is after Mark, but you're right, he's not right after Mark. Matthew, I mean, uh, John 14 and 16. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, <coughs> that he may abide with you forever. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. 
but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. Now, this is a good scripture demonstrating who Jesus is. Because he says, he dwelleth, which is present tense. Who is he talking to? The disciples. He dwelleth with you. Then he gives future tense and shall be in you. Who is he that was dwelling with them? Jesus. He's the comforter. All right. So I will pray the father and he shall give you another comforter, which is necessary because the comfort that you have right now is going to be gone. Now, comforter simply means someone to stand by your side. You know, there are times when we hurt over things and we just need somebody to be with us. And if I could just just throw this out a sidebar. Sometimes people just need you to be there. That's all. You don't have to come up with some great wise saying and, and have some moment of Zen with them. It, it, you don't, it doesn't require all that. Sometimes, sometimes people just need to know you're here. Just go sit with them. Don't have to say nothing. Sit with them for a while. If you look at Job, when he was hurt, when his three friends came for the first you know, three or seven days, something like that, pardon me, Seven days. For the first seven days, they didn't say anything. They just sat with him. That was it. Sometimes we just need somebody to either listen to us or just be with us. This is what the Lord is saying about the Holy Ghost. It's somebody to stand by you. You know, there are times as you get older, you see, there are times when there are things that can hurt you so bad that not even your husband or your wife can make you feel better. But the Holy Ghost can. In Ecclesiastics, chapter 4, Ecclesiastics chapter 4. And verse, starting at verse number 1. So I returned and considered all the oppressions that are done under the sun. And behold, the tears of such as were oppressed, and they had no comforter. And on the side of their oppressors, there was power. Wherefore, I praised the dead, which are already dead, more than the living, which are yet alive. Yea, better is he than both they, which hath not yet been, who hath not seen the evil work that is done under the sun. It is better for the man that is dead. And for the one that hasn't been born yet. Because at least they don't see all the problems that people have. If you go to the book of Job chapter 1. Real quick. It takes some time to really get this one. I actually, not, not one. I think it's. 14, Job 14. Man that is born of a woman is of a few days and full of trouble. As long as you're in this life, you're going to have some problems. Some have terrible problems. Some just have problems. But no matter who you are, if you're born of a woman, you're not going to live long, and you're going to have some trouble in your life. What is one of the things the Holy Ghost does? It comforts us. It stands by us. It gives us the reassurance that it's going to be all right. 
it takes faith to get saved. But our entire walk is not one of faith. If it was, how many people would stand? How long could you make it on a hope that one day, someday, something's going to happen good? Matter of fact, I can't remember where it is, but there is a... I, I'm not sure if it's a psalm where he said, I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. It would be more than I could handle if I never saw the goodness of God. It was always on the hope that one day, but I never saw it. So before I get saved, I don't have that comfort. It takes faith to get saved. But once I get saved, there are times when God will open up and reveal things and show things and do things that... You don't know before you get saved. And so the Holy Ghost is a comforter for us. The next one is a teacher. First so, uh, John, let's, let's go to First John chapter 2. First John chapter two. Um, verse twenty four. Let that therefore abide in you which ye have heard from the beginning. If that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, ye also shall continue in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he hath promised us, even eternal life. These things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you. And what he's dealing with is the fact that there are some people who are trying to trick you away from what is true. So he starts off with the things that I told you from the beginning. And Paul deals with this on more than one occasion. If any comes, a man or an angel, and preach any other gospel than what I have preached to you, then let him be accursed. Don't believe it. Even if I come my own self and change, don't believe it. Hang on to the truth that was given to you at the beginning. Because there are some people who will try to seduce you or try to draw you away from what you know or have been taught that is true. Uh, but the anointing, verse 27, but the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you, and ye need not that any man teach you. But as the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. So, why are y'all here? He said right here that you have need that any man teach you. You don't need any man teaching you, so why are y'all here? Forsaking not to, um, not the assembling. All right, but well, why are y'all listening to? Why aren't we just singing songs, clapping our hands, and chatting with each other, and and then we just leave? All right, St. John chapter 14, go back to that. That's what you're talking about. Uh, St. John 14. And verse number 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. So, y'all don't need me to teach you anything. The Holy Ghost is going to teach you, right? Is that what he's talking about? 
I've had people tell me that, quote that scripture and say, shame on you for going to church. You don't need a man teaching you. The Bible says the Holy Ghost will teach you all things. And there you are sitting up under some man letting him teach you. I said, well, are you a man? He said, well, yeah. And I said, then why should I be listening to you? He, mis he misinterpreted what the scripture was saying. If you go to 1 Corinthians, he clears all that up. In 1 Corinthians chapter number 2, somebody, someone online said, how can you hear without a preacher? Well, that's to get saved, but after that, Who's going to teach you? You need a preacher to get saved. He said, you don't need no preacher to tell you what to do. Because the Bible says you have not need for a man to teach you anything. All right. Well, that's the reason why some people are so lost. Because they grab one scripture and build a whole doctrine around it. You can't do that. It's here a little and there a little. Precept upon precept. Line upon line. You have to get and put it together in the right. The Bible says, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, doing what? Rightly dividing, Rightly dividing the work. So you have to know what goes where. Now let me show you something. This, this should clear up 1 John. Where is 1 Corinthians chapter 2? Uh... Verse 11, for what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. Now we have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. How can a man teach you? He can't. It takes the spirit of God in somebody to teach us. If you don't have the spirit, how can you tell me something? Now, let me just be clear about this because I, 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 even some preachers say this. I know they ain't got the Holy Ghost, but they deep. No, they're not. You're just shallow. That's all. If somebody... That, that, uh, what is something that... Is, is there any mothers in here? Yeah? Any? In, 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 there's mothers in here? Who would, how would you feel if a man come telling you what it's like to be pregnant and how you feel and, and uh, oh, it don't hurt that bad? How, how would you feel? Your first thing would be, how do you know? You ain't never had no baby. You don't know. Wouldn't we? How can somebody that's in darkness shed light on something to you and you in the light? They can't do it. They may be able to teach you history. They can teach you grammar. They can teach you what the meaning of something is as far as when you hear the word parable. What, what does a parable generally mean? When you hear the word allegory, an allegory is thus and so. Does, that, does anybody know what an allegory is? That's a parable. What's well, an allegory? He said it's a hypothetical story that's got a moral behind it. That's a parable. An allegory is a true story or a true place, and you get the point. Let me give you an example. If I go to work one more time and my boss says something to me, I'm going postal. That's an allegory. We know what that means, don't we? Because we have examples in real life of somebody that went to the post office and killed up a whole bunch of their fellow employees. So if somebody says that, that's an allegory. Well, they may be able to teach you what an allegory is, but they don't know where an allegory is in the Bible. 
They might guess and get it right, but that's all it is, guesswork. Because without the Holy Ghost, how can you learn? Do you know that's the reason why some of the most profound Bible teachers were not educated at all? Because the education of man will make you smarter, but the Bible says God has chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. You can try to get smart, but you can't outsmart God. God can reveal inside information to someone that has a spirit. He can reveal things to you that he keeps hidden from those that are well-educated. Colossians chapter number 2. Colossians 2, verse number 8. Colossians. All right. Colossians chapter 2, verse number 8. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Philosophy, vain deceit, traditions of men are the things that you have to be careful of because some philosophy sounds interesting. Some philosophy sounds good. It might even sound real. But there's a reason why the Apostle Paul says, beware lest any man spoil you or take from you through philosophy. Let me, let me give you an example of philosophy and a foolish and unlearned question. I had a man come to me when I was in college and he said, uh, you believe in God? I said, I sure do. He said, do you believe God has all power? I said, I sure do. I'm walking right into it. Sure do. He said, do you believe that God could make a rock so large that he couldn't even lift it? That's just foolishness. What does God need to make rocks for? He made the universe. <laughs> That's kind of stupid. Just philosophical stuff. He said, Stay away from that, lest they spoil you. And the word spoil here is not like what we do with kids. It means to steal something from you. So if someone breaks in your home and takes your thing, they've spoiled you. They've taken your property from you. He said, beware, be on the lookout, because there are some people who will, through philosophy, who will, through trying to make you feel good. And if I can give you an example of that, there are many preachers today, pastors, that are deceiving people through vain deceit. They're, they're trying to make them feel like you are important and you are somebody. And, and every, just stand up and tell your neighbor, I'm somebody in Jesus. And yet Jesus said, do you want to be important? Then serve your brother. Do they teach that? Isn't that what he said? Is there anybody here that's important if you are? See, the disciples were fighting over who's going to be the most important when we get to the kingdom of God. And he said, if you want to be important, then become a servant. But vain deceit says, I'm saved. I'm important. And then... Then the traditions of men, the traditions of men teach all kind of strange things. Some of them teach a man shouldn't get married if he's going to be a preacher. That's the traditions of men. They don't say that in the Bible anywhere. Yes, sir. He said people say that Peter was the first pope. And he never was married, and that's the reason why 
the priests don't get married. Actually, it's a different reason than that. I know I've heard the same thing, but that is not true. The Pope, yeah, but e even with that, that's not where that came from, but I've heard the same thing said. But that's from people just quoting something that they think without actually even knowing the history behind it. Because for many, many years, the priest, Pope, all of them, they got married. They did. They was going broke. Priest was having huge pieces of land and property. When they would die, guess who got it? Their wife, their children got it. So then they said, here, we'll fix that. You can't get married no more. That way, when you die, guess who gets it? The church. That's the reason why they stopped it. But, but you're right. Peter said that Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law. Now, that is a real trick to have a mother-in-law and you ain't married. That just doesn't work. That's one of them kind of things that defines its own self. You don't even need a dictionary. Mother-in-law means you're married. So you have to be careful. You have to be taught by the Spirit. And many of our brothers have gotten off because they listen to anybody and everybody that's talking about Jesus and don't even know whether they're right or not. The Bible says this, Beloved, believe not every spirit doesn't he tell us that believe not every spirit but try the spirit whether it be of God or not you have to test the waters see what they teaching and when it gets off turn it off you know why because eventually they're going to say something that sounds really good and then, then here we come in arguing well, how come the Bible's how come we got to come to church? The Bible does say that you don't need a man to teach you. How come we got to do that? Because you're listening to somebody that doesn't even know how to rightly divide the word of truth. Thank you. Got one. Amen. Hallelujah. I thought I was just teaching myself here for a minute. Ephesians chapter four. I'm not sure. Yes, ma'am. Oh, root, um, the, the fundamentals, the, the basic things of uh, the world that people will take and um, they will say things like, you, have you, you, you haven't heard of Aesop's fables. Um, they will use analogies or examples of things in, in the world. Let me just give you one, and it's from Aesop. He said this. There was a, a river, and a fox was trying to get across it, or a dog was trying to get across the river. And there was a scorpion that wanted a ride. And, and so the scorpion caught the dog, and he said, Hey, can you give me a ride across the river? And the dog said, No, because if I do, you'll sting me, and I'll die. The scorpion said, but if I sting you and you die, I'll drown too. So if you just give me a ride across, we'll both be safe. Dog thought about it and he said, okay. Told the scorpion to jump on his back. They got halfway across the river and the scorpion stung him. And he said, why did you sting me? Now we're both going to die. And he said, you knew what I was when you put me on your back. They will take a story like that and try to make something spiritual from it and say, well, that makes good sense. But that's, that's the rudiments of this world. That's the things that this world teaches. It's not what the Bible says. So you have to be careful of these kind of little stories that people come up with that really ain't got nothing to do with the Bible. Don't, when you're walking down the street and there's a pole and you're a couple, don't break the pole. That's the rudiments of this world. People will make that almost a spiritual thing. Some of them do. 
Don't walk under no ladder. Now you saved. Don't walk under a ladder. That's superstition. That's the rudiments of this world. The fundamental things of this world do not apply to God. Let me give you another fundamental of this world. An eye for an eye. Now they'll quote that. Some folks don't even know the Bible and they'll say, well, you killed, you did this, we're going to kill you. Somebody breaks in your house. They've broken in, they steal your CD player, your DVD player, some of your CDs, and they're walking out with it, and you got a gun, and you shoot and kill them. Are you wrong or are you right? Say What? You're wrong, but the law says that you have a right to protect your property. That's not what the, the, the law doesn't say that you can't, you can protect your property as long as you don't take their life. You break up in my house, I have a right to shoot you. Okay, I'm catching you coming up in my house. And I shoot and kill you. All right, I have a right to do that, according to the law, but am I wrong? See, that's when you're trying to apply the things of the world to the things of God. How are you going to take somebody's life over a TV, over a stereo, over some CDs? Ah, I showed them, they come up in here trying to steal my stuff, and I killed them. So you took a person's life because they took your stereo. That's silly. But the Bible tells us, if they ask for your coat, if they come up in your house asking for it, shoot them. No. I said, no, don't. Give them, give them your cloak also. It's not, he's not saying go out and give away all your things. He's saying if somebody is in need, help them. Some people steal because they ain't got nothing and no hope of getting anything. You know, it used to be that if you was homeless, you could at least go to the restaurant. And if they was throwing food away, they'd give it to you. They won't do that no more because if you get sick, you can sue them. So they, they won't even give homeless people food. They, they scared to do it, scared to help anybody. Some folks, they so desperate, they'll break into your house just to steal some food, and you'll kill them over it. That's the rudiments of this world. And that tell you it's okay. Yes, sir. He said in, in some states you got to prove that they was trying to cause you bodily harm. You can't just kill them because they come in your house. That's very true. But unless the policeman was there, you can say, he scared me. I thought he was going to try to kill me. And who's to say he didn't? Let me tell you something. That's the reason why policemen are taught, don't shoot to wound, shoot to kill. Because if you wound them and they survive, they can come back and sue you. It's easy to argue your point in court when the only person that was a witness is dead. You can, you can easily argue that. But if they're still alive, well, they might get sympathy from the jury. So they teach police, if you're going to shoot them, kill them. You don't want them to live. They'll come back and get you later. Did we read Ephesians 4? We didn't? All right, 4. Ephesians 4 and verse number 4. No, nope. 4 and 17. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated uh, from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart who being past feeling 
have given themselves over to lasciviousness, to work all uncleanness with greediness. But ye have not so learned Christ. There are some things about God that are just different than what the world teaches. So God devised a beautiful method. You get the Holy Ghost. He'll call you. He will allow you to be fed. And if you are faithful and diligent, God will reveal things to you. And then when you are qualified, after you have endured some things, after you have gone through some things, after you have demonstrated that you are at a certain level of maturity, God will send you out and have you teach others. You know who the most dangerous person is? The one that gets the Holy Ghost today and ready to go preach tomorrow. That's a dangerous person. Because they got the spirit, but they have zeal without knowledge. You excited, but you don't know what to do with it. A car is a wonderful thing, isn't it? I greatly appreciate the power of a car. But before I could get behind that wheel, I had to be trained. I had to go through some training. Then I had to go be tested. Then they said, all right, now you can take this thing and go out on the streets by yourself with it. How would you feel if you was getting on the airplane to fly somewhere and you heard the pilot and the co-pilot talking about Yep, I just graduated last week. And he said, I did too. <laughs> Matter of fact, I haven't really gone through any training, but I did read the book from cover to cover. I grab my bags, turn around, and get right back off that plane. <laughs> Ain't no way. I just, gradu I just graduated last week, and I ain't even had training. You ain't flying me nowhere. We have enough sense to not allow that to happen, but then we'll turn around because somebody's just on fire for Jesus. Woo! I'm saved. Hallelujah. Man, let me tell you about the Bible. And you don't even know your own self. And we'll just sit and listen. Well, they said they were saved. Woo! You know they are Christian. Oh, my God. Look at the... Uh, and and no, no pun intended. <laughs> You know they write with God. I mean, you could just feel the energy. That doesn't mean what they're saying is right. Was it last night we was talking about that a little bit, how some folks can fake that? Some people can fake it. They got it down good. They know just how to act. It ain't about nothing. One thing is for sure. The devil can imitate a lot of things. He can imitate a preacher. Matter of fact, the Bible says, um, that the, the devil's ministers can transform themselves into ministers of light. He said, how marvel ye that the devil's ministers, I, I can't quite get it, I'm paraphrasing it, he transformed himself into ministers of light, and he said, because the devil can transform himself into an angel of light. He's not ugly. The devil ain't ugly. He's not some deep, gravelly voice, somebody. That's fake. I hope y'all understand that. Yeah, you know that's fake, right? All right. You can't, you can't change your vocal cords just because you possessed. It doesn't work like that. The devil is not red. He doesn't have horns. He doesn't have a tail with a point on it. He doesn't have a tail at all. The Bible says he's beautiful. Why do you think he fools so many people? Because he does look so good. He is so inspirational. He is so deceptive in what he does. The Bible says he was more subtle than any of the beasts. He was, the devil just knew how to come in and say the right thing. 
Bible says he was perfect in the day that he was made. What did he what did he tell Eve that was so wrong? Just for it real quick. Genesis chapter 3. I want you to see how the devil did this because he hasn't changed anything. He still does it the exact same way today. Verse 1, Genesis 3 and 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, have God said ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden do you think that the serpent that the devil didn't know what God told him where, well where was he when God was telling Adam all right let's let me just take it another step further where was he when Adam was telling Eve you think he was all off somewhere on the other side of the planet minding his own business and just happened to come across these people, these two people. You think that's the way it happened? He was there. He waited. And then he just comes up and asks a question. Um, in your church, do y'all believe in this, that, and the other? Right away, we start getting uncomfortable. Because we, we know there's something behind it, don't we? In your church, does, are y'all allowed to eat from all of the trees? He did not come up and say, God lied to you, don't eat from that tree. He came up and just asked a question. Did God say that you can't eat from every tree? Now, here was the first mistake that was made. Verse 2, and the woman said unto the serpent, she should have not said nothing. That's how the devil gets a bunch of us. We want to argue with the devil. We want to come and tell the devil, well, there ain't nothing really wrong with it, but I just ain't going to do it because we don't believe in it. We start doing that kind of stuff. People will come up and, and challenge you. What you mean y'all can't drink in your church? Jesus drank. I don't even argue with people like that. Now, if someone has a genuine interest and they really want to know, I can show you in the Bible where it's wrong. But when somebody comes to me like that, I don't argue with them. I tell them, if you want to drink, go ahead. Don't bother me. I'm not drinking because you want to. I've had people try to make me look silly. We all out to dinner, company dinner, and it's like, come on, man, just a little. God will understand. I said, I don't want to do it. What, your church don't let you? I said, I don't want to do it. I'm not going to debate with them over what the church says and doesn't say. I don't want to do it. Now, why are you bothering me about it? I asked, I asked God at one time, I said, why are you bothering me about that? I ain't said nothing about you drinking. Why are you bothering me about not drinking? I'm not meddling with you. Why you keep bothering me? Because sometimes people just want to see if they can just get, because they know what you believe, or they wouldn't even ask it. The devil didn't go and say, did God say that you can't eat from this tree over here? Oh, he said you could? Oh, what about this one? Oh, well, what about this one? When they come up and ask you, they already know. Some people don't drink because they're in Alcoholics Anonymous. So they don't drink. They don't bother with them. They don't come up and say, come on, man, one, just take one drink. Show me in, in uh, the 12 steps where it says that you can't just have one drink. They don't do that. They don't bother with them. But if they think you go to church, show me in the Bible where it says, I've, I've had people tell me, if God made it, it's good. Do you believe that? Do you believe when he said, and the Lord put the, 
herbs in the field and it was good. Do you believe that? I said, absolutely. Then why you think it's wrong to smoke some of it? I'm like, well, I don't smoke weed. I don't drink hemlock. I said, if you think everything that God has made is good like that, go ahead and make you some hemlock tea and drink it. If you, if you, since you're so clever. <laughs> Sinners like company? Yes, they do. They do. That's what he said in Romans chapter 1, the last verse. Not only do they know they're wrong, but they take pleasure in people that do wrong with them. Yes, they do. The woman said, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, ye shall not eat it, neither shall ye touch it. And the serpent said unto the woman, ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day you eat thereof, your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. The lie was, ye shall not surely die. If I can just convince you of that, the truth goes down easy. The first sermon ever preached, two-thirds of it was truth. Because the Lord said in verse 22, And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. Man did know good and evil now. He did become as God. Now his, his mind has been opened and he understands the difference between right and wrong, good and evil, light and dark. Man gets it now. Now he's going to struggle with it if he'd only just not touch the fruit. He would have had a simple life. All he had to do is just continue on doing his own thing. But man violated that. The devil, if he can just get you to accept the one thing that's the lie, everything else goes down as truth. If the devil can get you to believe that a man came to the United States, the continent of the United States, and there he met with Jesus, and angels gave him glasses so that he could transcribe these golden tablets. If he can get you to believe that, all the rest of their doctrine goes down easy. Ecclesiastics chapter 12. Ecclesiastics 12, verse 10, the preacher sought to find out acceptable words that he, or that which was written was upright, even words of truth. The words of the wise are as goads and as nails fastened by the masters of assemblies, which are given from TV preachers. I'm sorry, uh, which are given from spiritual-minded people. Yeah. Is given from one shepherd. God doesn't inspire everybody in the church to teach everybody else in the church. I'll leave that for another time. But he says it here. The words of the wise are as goads. Do you know what a goad is? It's a what? A prod? Yeah, it was a long metal rod that had a sharp point on the end of it. And farmers, when the dirt is really hard and it, the, the plow digs down into it, sometimes the oxen couldn't, couldn't pull. Sometimes they would put logs on it. They couldn't pull it. And they would go, and they would go down so far that they would almost be down on their knees, trying, struggling, trying to pull forward. And they would take the goad and prick them in their behind with it, and when they did, it would give them a shot of adrenaline, and they would jump forward, and it would start moving. He said, that's what the words of the wise do. The words of the wise don't cause you to go do wrong. They prod you to go do right. Let us hear the conclusion. Uh, I'm sorry, ver uh, 12, and further by these, my son, be admonished, of the making of many books, there is no end, and much study is weariness of the flesh. 
Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment and every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. So, you know someone is wise when they're pushing you in the right direction. But the moment they say something like this, well, you're not saved, so if I was you, I would. That's not a wise person. A wise person says, run to the altar. You're not saved, run to the altar. Don't get into sin no deeper than you already are. Hurry up and get things straight. Because the older you get, the harder it is to get saved. The harder it is to let go of the sin that you was in. Hurry up, run. Any questions? If you got the Holy Ghost, you have the seal that says that you belong to him. You also have a teacher. Let me just sum it up with this from what I started with about no man teach you. The preacher needs to have the Holy Ghost. And when he's preaching, the anointing in him should be felt by the anointing that's in you. You should know that when you're hearing the truth, when it comes from the Bible, you should know that's true. How do you know it? I don't know. I mean, it's the anointing that's inside of me. It just, I know that's right. The preacher is filled with the Holy Ghost and he's living right. I'm filled with the Holy Ghost and I'm living right. And when I hear the truth, I just know it's the truth. The Holy Ghost will teach you that way. But he's sure not going to sit at home, let you sit at home and then he instruct a private Bible class just for you. God doesn't do that. Why did he have pastors? He said, I shall give you pastors after my own heart that will feed you with wisdom and knowledge. That's the purpose of the pastor, to feed you wisdom and knowledge. And so, if he don't have the Holy Ghost, he can't give you wisdom and knowledge because he don't have knowledge. All right, I'm harping on it. No questions? Stand up. Uh, we've got the funeral coming up Saturday, and there may be some here that's being asked to do some things. If you're able to do it, please uh, avail yourself. Do what's necessary. Anitra grew up here. Her family was from here. Came to Christ Temple, was members here for many, many years. We want to show the family some love. And anything that they need, if we can do it, we want to make sure that we are able to do that. All right, so if they ask you, I, I talked with uh, with two two of the family members family members today. They, I think they've got all the food they need, but they need some desserts. They may need folks to come and help to serve plates and fix the plates up at the repast. So whatever we can do, we need to to make sure that we're able to do that. All right, and instead of giving flowers or cards, they said that they would appreciate if we would give money. So we're not even going to send flowers. We're just going to give them a check instead of uh, purchasing something for them. They could use that. Um, I understand Anitra didn't even have insurance. So that's a, that's a hardship on a family. It really is. And everybody can't afford insurance. If I die, my wife going to live good. <laughs> Get her, Jesus. <laughs> But if she dies, I'm struggling. <laughs> she, got, she got life insurance on me. So not everybody has insurance. And funerals are very expensive. They really, really are. So let's do what we can to help the family out, all right? All right, let us look to the Lord. Yes, yes, ma'am. Yes. Oh, you're not going to walk? Oh, you you one of the ones that said amen about a cars being good. All right. All right, yes. We'll, we'll, we'll be praying. All right. Let the words of my mouth, meditations of my heart, be acceptable in thy sight. 
strength. O Lord, my strength, my redeemer, in Jesus' name. Amen.